Good morning, interweb. Let's conlang. In this video, let's talk about creating conlangs for non-humans, specifically creatures based on and pretty close to real-world animals. Now, usually I just treat my non-humans as humans and conlang as normal. They look non-human on the outside, but on the inside, they possess all the articulatory machinery needed for human speech. Or they possess some sort of made-up organ that allows them to perfectly mimic human speech. Basically, my cat people always end up being either humans cosplaying cats or parrots cosplaying cats, and I don't like it. I want my cat people to talk like cats, damn it, not like Bob from down the road. Unfortunately, anatomically informed non-human conlanging is way outside my comfort zone. So I've brought along creature conlang creator extraordinaire, Alex, aka Farmer, Hi. to help out. So Alex, where do we begin? So the first step is to choose the animal species that you want to write your conlang for. Naturally, there's a ton of options here, obviously. So for the sake of brevity, let's focus on cats, lizards, and birds in this video. After that, I'd recommend doing some research into the oral anatomy of the animal you're modeling your species after, the upper digestive and respiratory systems, and learn a bit about the vocalizations that they already make. Yeah, study your target species' tongue, mouth, teeth, nose, and throat to find out what speech sounds they potentially could or could not produce. Horses, for example, are what's called obligate nasal breathers. They can only breathe through their noses, so they'd never be able to make the obstructions in airflow with the tongue, lips, etc. involved in human speech. So, that means if horses could talk, they'd never be able to form consonants and vowels the way we do. Yep, figure out what your species anatomy is like and stick to it, so you can keep your phonology believable and consistent with your vision. Speaking of phonology, I assume that would be the next logical step after species selection and anatomy homework. Yes, so for my avian conlang, uh, spoken by a fictional corvid species, I looked at these diagrams of a bird's mouth. You can see they have no soft palates, alveolar ridges, or teeth for velar, alveolar, or dental sounds, but they do have a hard palate and a feature called the coana, which is fused in mammals. The coana connects to the nasal cavity, so closing it could change a nasal sound to a modal one. I gave uh, a palatal series, a palatal lateral series, and a coanal series, which I pronounce as uvular when I speak the language. Instead of labials, we have rostrals, from rostrum meaning beak. I've heard crows make trill-like sounds, and even if they don't do them with their beak, cranes definitely do, so it's an avian possibility. Crows also seem to make more creaky sounds sometimes, so I added a distinction of creaky voice. Birdsong also relies a lot on tone, so I added a lot of distinctions there as well. Now, to be clear, your birds sound like actual real-life birds, right? Yes. So this phonology is really a sort of human reproducible approximation of their speech. Exactly. When I speak it, I approximate it with the hardware I have in my body. I like it. Very novel. Also, it's worth pointing out that because we're dealing with non-humans, we don't need to, and probably shouldn't, stick to the norms of human phonological inventories. Like, for example, I wouldn't normally recommend having so many tone distinctions, but for birds, it works perfectly. Now, what about cats? For cats, you'll notice their anatomy is much closer to humans, since they're mammals. They have hard and soft palates and nice big tongues. Not big enough to allow them to make interdentals with such fangs, though. Like other carnivorans, they have very defined grooves on their palates. It's important to note, though, that even most mammals don't have the specific round lip muscles that us humans have to whistle, kiss, and pronounce bilabials and labialized sounds with. So, depending on how cat-like and how person-like your cat people are, those may be off the table, at least in onset position. You can find all sorts of videos online of cats making strange noises. So you'll find no shortage of inspiration there. Yeah, leaning into that weird chattering sound they make might be fun. For sure. And even their most basic vocalizations sound like they're full of semi-vowels and diphthongs, so having a lot of those could really make your language sound like cat speech. Cool, lizards. Are pretty quiet, aren't they? 
Lots of lizard-like fantasy peoples are based on larger, more fearsome lizards like monitors, or even on other kinds of reptiles. But the only type of real lizard that's evolved to really vocalize with any kind of phonation is the gecko. Geckos have larynxes with vocal folds much like humans, and nice fleshy tongues, but they have coanal openings between their mouths and nasal cavities just like birds. They have pretty squeaky voices, but theoretically they'd be deeper, scaled up to human proportions. Lots of reptiles are known for hissing, which they do with their glottis. Physiologically, this is pretty much the same as articulating a glottal fricative. <sighs> but this might be a case where you'll want your human approximation to be different mechanically, so it still sounds the same. Awesome, so that's phonology for cats, lizards, and birds. Done. Let's talk grammar. I chose to make uh, pretty analytic to mimic the discrete and repetitive cause that crows and ravens make. But honestly, a lot of animals sound like that, and part of the physical aspect of the human language faculty seems to be the ability to move our mouth parts really quickly and accurately to make different speech sounds fluidly. In fact, some of the animals that make the most long and fluid sounds are the ones that have been hypothesized to have some sort of grammar of their own. Like the Carolina chickadee. So it's thought that the calls of the Carolina chickadee comprise six distinct note types, A, E, B, C, D, H, and D, in that order. Repetition and deletion is permitted, so something like this could be a grammatical chickadee call. But something like this would not. It breaks that grammatical order. Also, each note appears to have a distinct meaning. Scientists have found that the chickadee calls become more A note heavy when a possible predator is approaching. E note heavy calls seem to signal that the calling chickadee is higher off the ground. C note heavy calls seem to indicate that the calling chickadee is in flight and D-note heavy calls appear to signal that a perch predator or food has been detected. So something like this could mean I'm flying around up here and have sighted some food. How cool is that? It's great. So in short, you can kind of do what you want with regards to grammar and syntax. And like the creativity of making your own non-human phonology, non-human conlangs can be an opportunity to really play with interesting ideas of information structure. Nobody will criticize your conlang for breaking the universals of human language if it's not a human language. For sure. Now, what about vocabulary? This is mostly down to world building. How a language divides its speaker's experience into semantic fields is strongly tied to culture, and the behavior of a wild animal might be reflected by its culture if it evolves human-like social structures. For example, crows are known to perform so-called funerals, where if they see a dead body of a fellow crow, they gather around it screaming alarm calls. It's believed that the purpose of this is to warn others that the area where the body was found is a dangerous area where a predator might attack. So inspired by this example, I added words like kyan, which means a dangerous area where a funeral might have taken place, as well as ngh, a dead body of a fellow speaker, as opposed to any carcass. Yeah, that's a good example, but vocabulary also reflects a speaker's sensory experience, right? Definitely. Since many birds can see light in some ultraviolet wavelengths slightly beyond what we can see, has a word, for a color that includes what we see as purple, but also some objects and materials that we might think of as a different color, but which reflect a lot of ultraviolet light as well. Since most birds need to tilt their head upward to swallow liquid, Ah, collexifies drink and look up iteratively. Similarly, a lizard might think of smell and taste as the same thing. Lastly, a lot of numeral systems in human languages are based on the appendages we count on. So think about that if your speakers count on specific appendages. So basically, you need to spend some time thinking about how an animal perceives and interacts with its environment and use that to inform their vocabulary. Exactly. Anyways, hopefully that'll give people some food for thought when it comes to beginning the process of creature conlanging. Links to more of Alex's stuff in all the usual places, folks. Alex, thanks a mil for stopping by. Sure thing, bye for now. Or rather, yum. Good morning, Interweb. I hope you enjoyed this video. A little bit different from the usual fare. Thank you so much for watching. And also, massive thanks goes out to all the patrons who help make Artifaxian a possibility. In particular, Lycan, Johan Spadka, Oliver Reed, Spencer Brownlee, Alexander Roper, Andrew Pichahale, John Huyer, Rip the Passe and World Anvil. And of course, another massive thanks goes out to Alex for collaborating with me on this video. Links to all their stuff in all the usual places, go check them out. Until next time, it grows.